welcome pudding people to another episode of everybody loves pudding i'm your host ken bread pudding seymour with your other host richard rice pudding geiger uh, hello we tried to pick the blandest of the puddings for this episode R- rice pudding pretty bland pretty bland So we have a fantastic episode for you today. Uh, We're kind of excited about it. At least I know I am. Are you excited, Richard? What? What about? Huh? (laughs) Yeah. uh, Sorry. Early onset Alzheimer's. Uh, That's it's a terrible it's a terrible thing. Uh, We have to deal with it regularly. I thought we were talking about Spider Man. (laughs) Eventually, eventually Mm. we will be. Um, but we are going to be talking today about Indie PopCon 2019. Both of us had the fantastic opportunity to be able to attend and see what they are able to come up with to entertain the masses. And it was, it was really cool. What'd you think, Richard? So when it comes to even just the convention center in Indy, I, I can say the only time I've really been in the convention center was parking somewhere and walking through and going to a Colts game. Mm. So I've never been there for... Wait, wait, that's not true. I've been there for... Not in that section. For, I think, like, maybe further back, there was something. My niece had a, uh, like, a cheer contest there years ago. So n- not much time spent in that area in general. But I will say, in talking about the convention in general let's just say even from a logistical standpoint indy's really good about having everything pretty close pretty centralized so it's easy to get to you can park close if you're not staying um there is lots of parking although i imagine if it's super busy the parking does fill up um this was a weekend uh of, of course most of those conventions are going to be stretched out over the course of a weekend but when I was there, I had no problem getting in and out of the place. Um, I parked literally a block down the, the road from the entrance. It was easy to find, easy to get into, easy to navigate. When we got in, there was lots and lots of people, as you would expect, doing um, all types of things from playing games to being in cosplay to um, just sitting around chatting to a couple people doing the most random thing on the side of the hallways that I still to this day can't understand what they're doing. Anyway, um, nothing to do with the convention, that's for sure. But when you get into the convention, there was lots of people um, in a certain sense. It was raining, and it's been raining here forever. I, I've, I think I was expecting it to be busier later in the day because when we got there earlier in the morning, it was before lunch, there were still people there. There yeah. were still lots of folks. There were different sections um, of people selling stuff, different people inside the actual convention, basically the area that they had cordoned off for the main, let's, let's call it the features, where all of the, all of the vendors, where all the artists were, all of the um, stars were. And they had them all sectioned off in different areas, easy to find, easy to locate, easy to navigate through. Um, that was one thing I was surprised on. I just felt like hey, when when you were in the downtown area, like the little banners that they had up on street poles were for blocks around it, all about the indie pop gun. So I yeah. feel like it was marketed, like people knew about it. And there was people there. But the, the, I guess the impression that I got, and we'll, we'll kind of mention it, I think, a little bit when we get to the people that we talked to, was that there was quite a few of the people who had booths that you could talk to there wasn't anybody there like there was no line there was no way we had plenty of opportunity to just stand and talk to people and which was at 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 the same time extremely cool i mean because uh each of these individuals has managed to contribute to pop culture in in some substantial way as an uh, an actor actress voice actor voice actress So it's nice to be able to have uh, an extra couple minutes or or two to get to know them a little bit and ask them some questions. But at the same time, you kind of want there to be a little bit more of a surge for them. um, Because 
it's just you know that they're there for you know, multiple reasons. Obviously, they want to meet the fans and and have that experience. But I'm, I'm always hoping they're going to make some money too. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things when we went to different folks to talk to them. Part of the emphasis when we asked them if we could talk was, "Hey, I know you're here to make money, and it's not our position to get in the way of you making money." Um, so we never try to interfere with that. No, no. But the other thing with that too is. If these folks come to this convention and they don't make money, they're not going to come back to this convention. So, so that just means it's less of a draw. And if it continues on like that, this type of convention just won't happen. Just no one's going to come. Uh, I, I have to think that this is an aberration because I've talked to people that have been to other pop cons in the past, and the the attendance has been pretty what pretty high from what has been described to me to the point that I know at least in the early ones there were instances where there were lines to meet and get autographs for certain of the celebrities that were there and there just wasn't enough time uh, they they would be in line the entire period that that person was signing and then it'd be over and people weren't able to get their signatures um, we saw that with maybe one person maybe but I even think they got all the way through that line for that individual as well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a, a mixed thing. So, for anybody that's not been to PopCon, it is uh, it is in the Indianapolis Convention Center. And like you were saying, it's it's host to a lot of stuff, and it's, it's enormous. I mean, so even though PopCon has a decent size to it, they were able to fill maybe a quarter of the main convention hall and then they had the rooms across from the convention hall filled with a variety of different things like laser tag and and some other things which was kind of cool and then the rooms above had panels but that was it there were two or three other events going on at the exact same time that any pop con it's, it's not quite like a, a gen con where when it happens nothing else is happening it cannot happen there is no room for it to happen wasn't the um Pride Parade also happening at the same time? I don't know if it was that when when I was there on that Saturday. If it was, I know it was that weekend for sure. I don't know. Um, there were signs at some of the restaurants that say, hey, we're open until whatever. So that people knew that if you one o'clock in the morning, they could go in and get food. So yeah. I, 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 I wonder if something like that maybe would have siphoned off some of the traffic too, because the Pride Parade is really popular. And uh, generally a really good time. Um, so possibly, but it's probably just mainly the weather. That was just <clears> not cooperative at all, which, you know, it's awful to see. But, you know, it was at the same time kind of cool. So in the main in the main hall, this is this is a convention fueled primarily by the people that you have a chance to meet. But that's not the only thing that's there. I mean, the the vendors uh, were fairly plentiful. I mean, you had oh, yeah. t-shirts, you had uh, knickknacks and memorabilia, and uh, there was a little... Um, windows. What? That's right. I forgot about the windows. <laughs> <laughs> some some interesting choices uh, that you could that you could see throughout the the hall. And we're not talking about Microsoft either. No, no, no. There was software there, just not that. Um, so I mean, you could. There were about ten rows, eleven rows that you could go through, um, and with the width of the main hall, um, it. It wouldn't take too long. I mean, an afternoon, and you could go through the entire mm -hmm. vendor hall, and that's being comfortable, not having to move quickly from from booth to booth. And oh yeah, you you could go there in the in the opening in the opening part, like when when most people are still starting to show up, maneuver through, then totally just spend an hour and go get food somewhere. There's plenty of places in any to do that. Then come back and spend the whole afternoon there and you're, you're good. I, I think if you had ideas to talk to certain guests or, you know, do a, an autograph or, or whatever, that might chew up a little bit more time depending on how busy they were. Yeah. But, you know, um, an afternoon's worth, I think if you did it from start to finish, you could, 
do everything you needed to do pretty much on that day i mean the only the only real reason i can think of to do multiple days at something like this they do have panels that, that's what different I was thinking. panels each day and then if there are enough of the individuals that you want to meet uh like for example i was there for all three days and friday not everybody was there so um it doesn't happen always, but sometimes people will be there Friday and Saturday, not Sunday. Sometimes it'll be there Saturday and Sunday and not Friday. Yes. So if you want to meet this one person and one of them is going to be there Friday, one is going to be there Sunday, sometimes you kind of have to, to bridge it out to, to get the opportunity to, to meet some of these individuals. Plus, Saturday tends to be, traffic-wise, mm. the busiest of days. Yeah. And if you're... A person that you want to talk to or see is going to be there on Friday. That actually might be the best day to go because there might not be as many people there. Easier access is yeah. what we should say. But uh, I think uh, I, I'm really impressed with the organization. I mean, it's we've been to several uh, conventions this year, and it, organizing any convention is controlled chaos. Um, and I think, I think that the PopCon people did a really excellent job. You knew where everything was. You knew where to go to find everything. You could generally find somebody to help point you in the right direction. Uh, there weren't any mysterious um, absences. Uh, we'll get to that in a different, uh, <laughs> in a different episode uh, considering something else. Um, they updated the website regularly. So you knew when there were going to be cancellations because that's going to happen too. There were some people that were supposed to be there that just couldn't be there uh, due to conflicts that arose or sickness or whatever. There was only one individual that I can think of that was supposed to be there and I didn't see a cancellation and she just didn't show up. Um, well, one of the uh, of individuals from the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show, which I'm kind of sad. I wanted to meet her because she's... Seemed pretty cool, but uh, yeah, we got to talk to Henry Simmons briefly, so that was we at least got little one bit. one little bit of uh, uh, Agents of Shield action there. But what we were able to do is to talk to some really cool individuals that we kind of want to share our conversations with. Um, the first of which, I'm really kind of this is the kind of thing that I geek out about a mm -hmm. little bit. I I love all types of individuals that will contribute to our shared theatrical experience, whether that's live, whether that's uh, movies, whether it's TV. But I, I have a special love for voice actors and actresses just because of the, the unique position that, that they're often put in trying to give life just from a two-dimensional standpoint from what's animated the the way that that has to work around with the people that are actually creating the artwork and it's just kind of one of those things that's fascinating and they become so ingrained and so iconic sometimes that when you hear somebody's voice sometimes you go immediately oh i always love this this individual whoever it is and i'm glad yeah, you know, I just get this little geek moment that they're involved in this project. And, and when we do these interviews, we have this uh, discussion on this podcast. It's kind of the perfect, I, I guess, <coughs> perfect example of these voice actors recognition. Because as we talk to them, I feel, like, especially our first guest, that you can just be like, you're not seeing any pictures um of that person unless you happen to be one of the five viewers on our uh, youtube video that we we'll have <laughs> uh, that you're like wh wh where do i recognize that voice from and this first gentleman has done just gosh voices for everything yeah i mean he's 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 got uh he's got a list of accomplishments that are pretty impressive now technically only in one comic book movie per se and that was sparks if you're familiar with Sparks, much like the five people that saw our YouTube hmm. video, you're probably one of the five people that saw Sparks. That's probably unfair. But uh, it's not a film that a lot of people are really familiar with, which is unfortunate because it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, tons and tons of television work, uh, whether yes. it's animated or whether it's... And video game work, too. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, for me, uh, watching the current CW shows, having him be the voice of Grodd was really, really cool. 
Um, I know you watch a lot of the animated uh, stuff, whether it's DC or Marvel. Did you watch the Guardians of the Galaxy? The cartoon? cartoon? Yes. Yep. So being Drax on that, again, very unique voice. You just immediately recognize. I have a son that was huge into... Uh, Beast Wars and Beast Machines, and he did a voice in Beast Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just you know, David Sobolov, if if you're not with us at this point, is is the gentleman we're speaking with, and he was just such a fantastic gentleman to share some of his time with us, and just so excited to to talk to him. So a, a couple other ones I wanted to throw out uh, too. So he was actually in the mo- he was a voice uh, actor in the most recent transformers movie yeah he was a voice of blitzwing in that um he's actually a voice in fortnite mm-hmm. and i know a lot of people play that game and love it or hate it there's millions and millions of people playing that game oh, yeah. uh he was a black knight in fortnite so uh he he's he's in stuff that millions have people millions of people have heard his voice yeah um recently as well he played uh lobo in the young justice that's right that's right uh, let me see here he not only did he do grod in uh the cw but he also did so there is um quick little snippets I th- gosh i think it's on the cartoon network uh justice league action a recent like that's a recent release uh, that was just within the last couple of years. They did th- these little 15-minute Justice League cartoons. Oh, and cool. And they're real fun, real cartoony. They're in between, like, the Justice League and, like... Uh, Teen Titans Go? Y- <laughs> yes, kind of. Or, like, um, oh, gosh, what's the... There's a Batman cartoon, Batman... Uh, Batman Beyond, Batman Brave and the Bold. Batman Brave and the Bold, Brave and the Bold. Where that one was kind of more cartoony. Yeah. So it was like in in between that, and he did Grodd in that as well. So yeah, too cool. So take a listen and uh, enjoy as we have a chance to just have a few minutes to see what it's like to be this fantastic voice actor. Right. Uh, this is a Jizo Pete podcast. <laughs> I'm David Sobolov. <laughs> Uh, pleasure to be you today here. Uh, okay, so, no, really, we're here today at the Indie Pop Con convention with a fantastic gentleman by the name of Mr. David Sobolov. Good day, sir. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm good. Good. So, uh, tell us a little bit about why you're here and what you're doing. I am here to meet people. See, I, I flap my lips in Burbank, and I never know what's going to happen until I get to one of these conventions. Then I find out what sort of impact our characters have. Mm. And it's pretty amazing sometimes how people will be entertained by them. They'll be moved by them, maybe. Yeah. They might even be inspired. They might even be wanting to do something with their life because of them. All of us, not just me. And it's amazing to hear their stories. And there's so many people here with so many stories. Uh, right now, if we look across the convention, there's just all types of different actors, actresses, uh, people lending their voice to different characters. So where did you get your start? I- I'm think- Was it around the uh, Transformers? A uh, be- little before that, I did some anime for a bit. Uh, this is around 1993, 4, and 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I-, I met an agent at one point in Vancouver. I was doing plays, and they heard my voice. They said, come do villains. So I started doing villains. Um, around the time I was doing Transformers, I did Sabrina, the animated series. Ooh. Some people may remember that. I was Spooky yep. Jar, who only spoke in rhymes, spoke in haiku. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And I just want to, I don't know if anyone will remember that show, but my inspiration for the character was weird. It was the grandmother on Bewitched. Nice. Because of the yes. spells that she would say, yes. you know. And they yes. looked all over town for someone. It was the night before the recording. They couldn't find anyone. They thought of me. They brought me in. They wanted it to be um, Indian from India uh, sounding. And um, I wasn't really ready for that accent, so I did something else. And they were happy, and next morning I was recording. Nice. It, d- now... It, where did you kind of pick up the the voice acting bug from? Like it, it found me. I didn't know I'd be doing this with my life. You know, I was a, a French horn player. I was a musician. I toured with an a cappella group, singing for a year, and I was sort of looking for my place in the arts. You know, where I could settle. Tenor. You're a tenor, right? Tenor. Very <laughs> high tenor. I can shatter glasses with the height of my voice. It's amazing. Nice. So, okay. So, I've Not. I've used accumulated these uh, different types of characters. Mm-hmm. Which ones, I, I want to kind of go in different realms here, so which one do you think 
personally is your favorite of the characters that you've kind of lend your voice to? When somebody asks me that, I say, I love all my children equally. Yes. Um, but there are some highlights. You know, of course, Grodd that I'm doing now on The Flash is super fun. Do you know he's whispered? I don't really scream him much at all. It's all the technicians that make it super loud and sound. You can sound kind of godlike if well, if you're quiet, but also I'm going to show you something physically. If, if, you're, if you're putting your hand in a straight line and just moving it very, very slowly, it's way more interesting than if you wave it crazily in the air mm -hmm. because you're anticipating, you're wondering what's going to happen. So it's that mystery that makes the villain interesting. Nice. Very so good. So villains. Villains are kind of my favorite thing. Your favorite one. And Drax is awesome. You know, from... Did mm -hmm. I pull out the clip? Yeah, I always pull out the cord there. Uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy. That will be on Disney Plus in the fall, so a lot more people will get to see it. There, there have already been uh, a couple seasons, or at least one of... There's been three seasons. Yeah. and but It's been on Disney XD. Not a lot of people get, can see that. And we're really excited that, for, you know, everyone's going to buy Disney Plus. So that everyone's going to get to see it and binge it. So all, all those things that you've had on all those seasons of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, now uh, they're going to roll into Disney Plus so everybody can see all of those things anyway. Right? Yeah, all three seasons. Yeah, I'm... I've, I've seen, I want to say, like the first couple seasons. So uh, we have Disney XD. I tend to watch a lot of cartoons on there. So That's great that you have that. Yeah, it's, I, I feel like, I think like it's a pretty popular platform. Uh, now, now we're looking at a, a kind of a range of different things here, too. So you've got some Marvel. You've got some, even some DC sprinkled in there. Lots right? of so Transformers, Transformers over the years. Um, I'm curious as to this one that I'm seeing right here on the end, the most popular thing apparently in the world, uh, some, some Fortnite voice. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Uh, it's a Russian voice, uh, Russian, Ruski, Wodka, and he dances like all the other ones do. And when I got to the dance, it said in the script, um, dance efforts, and I just went, dance efforts. And they kept it in the in the game, which I thought was funny, because he says, dance efforts, and then he starts dancing. So I thought that was funny. Um, it's exciting to be in a, a game that has 250 million users. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, I'm going to a convention in a couple of weeks in um, Salt Lake City. That's a gaming convention. My first gaming-only convention. I don't know what to expect. I don't know if there's going to be a line out the door or, no, or crickets. We'll find out. Well, I, with that particular game, I don't think you can really tell, because it's all age groups i mean 250 million across the world it's mm -hmm. it's just crazy how that thing has kind of gone from where it was to where it is now uh, i want to inject something when you do something that big you would think oh big egos you know and, and everyone's like uh got their nose in the air everyone that works on is so super down to earth it's amazing we're just having it's, we don't have fun you don't have fun yeah it actually really is true so we're in there just playing and having fun and not really realizing that there's 250 million people listening to my voice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so That's a little scary if you think about it. So that, that one, obviously, you said fun, easy. It, what was the most challenging of your characters to kind of create or to continually um, voice? There, there was a um, Call of Duty that I, I did. It was Call of Duty Modern Warfare. And um, it was an extreme scream situation. He was commanding troops. Um, it became a fairly memorable role, but I lost my voice for six months and my career was almost over. And wow. that was a turn turning point for me, realizing that you're a human being, you're not the characters that you play, you can't scream like they can. In fact, um, uh, a lieutenant in the army contacted me and was talking, was thinking, say, oh, it sounds so great, and I, I wish I, I could command like you could. And I said, well, it's fictional, A, and B, if you tried that, you would lose your voice in about two hours. So, And I did that for many days of, of four hours of screaming, and oh, it was gosh, just too yeah. much. So did that lend you to do more things as far as uh, care for your voice? I did change the way I approach things. Um, the screamy screams are two hours or less. Because that happens, a lot of the characters that I play are high action characters, mm -hmm. so there's always some screaming, especially like the, the um, Bumblebee movie playing Blitzwing. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was performing for an IMAX screen, so it had to be the biggest of the biggest performances. But mostly my characters, if you audition with something they like, they want you to repeat it. So I just make sure I audition with something that's not going to hurt my voice. Give them a choice that's good, good for me physically as well as creatively. Nice. And that's helped a lot. And I play characters. I don't do voices, and that helps too. Yeah. Because even screaming is a lot easier on your throat if you're really in the situation in your mind and you're not just putting on a scream. That yeah. makes sense? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I get it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
does that even change how your eating habits and drinking habits and those types of things before you go into the studio? You have to treat your voice like you're an Olympic athlete. You don't go to bars where you have to talk loudly to people the night before a session. Um, I try to take a day off every week. Frank Sinatra did this on Sundays. He didn't talk. And just having that vocal rest really helps a lot. Hmm. They're big, thick cords that I have, and they recover pretty quickly. But I just need sometimes a day, and texting is great. So I can continue like, <laughs> yeah, yes. talking to people and doing business and email and, and not open my mouth for a day or two. That's perfect. Oh, wow. You're good. You got the mic, man. Okay. I just wonder if you had any questions while we're here as you've accumulated. You? Okay, I got one. I got one. So uh, the shows that you uh, did, uh, Depth Charge and the Beast Wars, mm -hmm. uh, what did you think? Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you will see uh, an example of the artwork beforehand. Sometimes you don't. Did they give you an idea of how this was going to look as you voiced the character ahead of time, or did you find out after? That was a, one of the earliest super secret projects. I was taken in a corner, really literally taken in a corner, so nobody could see me. An envelope was came out, and the picture of the character came out. Not, uh, We have a major star coming here. <laughs> That's really loud. Um, and it wasn't even taken out of the envelope. He pulled it up just so it could be in view for about 10 seconds and then put it back in. Hmm. I was the only one outside the office that had ever seen it. And then we went into the audition after that. And it was a 40-minute audition. We layered that character within an inch of its life, all the different emotions and feelings he had. Yeah. And we sort of built it together to something they were really happy with. And happily, they, they hired me. Do you, and do you find that most of your work tends to be like that? They give you an idea of the character. You, they give you a script. You voice it. And then they work the character around how you have voiced it. Yeah, it's called prelay animation, so they, they do the voice first for a reason, exactly what you're saying. They animate to us because hopefully our voice sounds animated yeah. and it gives them some ideas oh. and then they draw to that. All of my characters are bald. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, maybe they see me and decide. No, they're decided in advance. But isn't it funny, other than um, Lobo, so many of my characters are bald. It's really true. Or they're robotic and don't have any hair. Grodd has hair. <laughs> I assume Dr. Fate does, depending on... Uh, he take, you know what? He does take his helmet off when he becomes the other character. Yeah. I'm not sure if he has hair or not. Never got that far in the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but in, on, in, um, in Justice 2, there was this amazing scene that we recorded where he was like crying at the feet of Superman, and I don't think they ever used it. I think they let that go. Hmm. And it was like one of the most dramatic things I'd ever done in a game. Well, those cutscenes in those things are when you put them together because you can find them on YouTube as like a mm -hmm. two-hour. It's like a feature-length movie, so they're pretty intense. I, th those are pretty awesome. Um, now, I, one other thing that I see on here is Ben Ten. So tell us a little bit about Ben Ten because that that is an awesome cartoon. Well, when I play Upgrade on Ben Ten, Terrace, it's supposed to be Ben Ten's voice, but with a deep voice. And, it, and the character idea came from me in the audition, and they really shouldn't have cast me because I'm not right for that kid kind of voice, but they thought the idea was great, and I could come up with it and uh, come up with the idea for the character mm -hmm. voice. So they brought me in. They were very generous to bring me in. And it was one of the most challenging characters, <laughs> even though it's sort of a comedic thing. Tara Strong, who plays Ben, mm -hmm. she voices every line, and then I repeat it in a deep voice because to get that kid cadence... Not super in my wheelhouse, but they helped me so much on that show to sound as good as I can. Huh. I don't mind admitting it, it's fine. That's that's actually pretty interesting. Unusual. But the other character is more in my wheelhouse because I, I play this Vin Ethanol character. It's yeah. a Vin Diesel spoof. <laughs> and that's that's totally the kind of character I play. That's actually pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Well, you're um, good. I think we're good. I think we've taken up enough of your precious time here today, so we don't want to chew up any more of it oh, when no you worries. Thank some you for, uh, here, thanks so. for coming by. Thank appreciate you for taking it. the time. I appreciate that. And we're back. There was amazing a plays back there, uh, Richard. Tell us about that ground ball out into between first and second, and then there was the touchdown. Is that how sports goes? I don't really watch sports. I forgot about the field goal that was in there right. as just after it went between first and uh First and second, so I knew there's something like that. Eh. Yeah, so fantastic to to talk to David. He was he was one of the uh, the highlights of the day.
for for me for sure. Uh, we we were able to talk to quite a few really interesting people, but I had to had to maintain my inner my inner excitement mm-hmm. to not let it kind of go. Now, for those of you that didn't notice, I'm sure most everybody did. We have swapped places, kind of, kind of, just uh, just to make it quite uh, not quite so odd. Whenever I look this way. Now I'm looking at Richard. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's what we were doing before. It's just, you know, the fun of recording. We learn these things as we go. You get to grow with us. Feel mm. the growing pains and, and the little triumphs as we figure out exactly what we're doing. Okay. So, now. Moving on. Um, I will throw out there, just because it's the perfect time to do it, uh, as we go through our video portion here on youtube those of us who are listening uh those of you who are listening to us via the podcast the youtube video will have snippets of everything in it to our our trip around um the actual hall ken brought yep. his fancy camera and took, a, took a little stroll around so we'll have some of that up in there um, on the instagram page that we've got which is uh at Pudding Guys. Yep. The Twitter page, which is Real Pudding Guys. That's right. Does have a few photographs of us with these folks that we're going to be speaking about, too. So Definitely. if you want to get a little glimpse of who these people are, uh, we'll have their uh, their profiles up on our webpage, www.everybodylovespudding.com. That's right. Plus, those pictures have already been up for a little while on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, they on Facebook as well. Yeah, well, to a certain extent. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we know we, we work. The, the Facebook just doesn't so get so much them. time. I have to pick and choose which which social media gets more attention, and I'm afraid that the Twitter gets a little more attention than the Facebook. And does. that's that's quite all right. That's quite all right. But there's another thing that we have. we have so many things, right? What's the other one that we have? Well, the other one, and some would say the most important one, mm. or at the very least the newest one, is we have a Patreon account. You can be the proud supporter of the Pudding Guys. Mm. Be a producer in in spirit and, more important, in monetary uh, <laughs> donation. Help us create these shows. Help us go out there and find the interesting people to talk to, to be able to increase our video quality, our audio quality, our air quality. Well, maybe not the air quality, but you know everything else. We will become better, and we want you along for the ride. Right now... A single dollar is all it takes per month to support the Pudding Guys create what we're creating. Now, we will have some new stuff coming out here shortly, some other tiers, because we're going to have some neat new stuff that we're going to be able to offer. But I'm not really going to get into that until we actually have it to offer, because that would just be uncool. You know, too much of a a, a tease, too far out. And then we would just trip over ourselves and be like... uh, certain directors that we have less of a fondness for that over promise and under deliver. We want to over deliver after we over promise. And that's no measly dollar. <laughs> it's a very important dollar. It's a very important dollar, but you know, back, back onto it. We, uh, we were able, like I said, to talk to some very cool people. Now you, we talked just briefly about Batman, the brave and the bold, mm-hmm. but you know, most people that know Batman think of the, Batman, or at least in the animated size, the Batman, the animated series that was released, uh, what, in the 90s? Yes. Is it that old? I know Superman was in that time frame. I think it's right around there. But uh, regardless, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of one of the, one of the first, in my mind, one of the first DC animated properties to just get it. And just hit it on all levels. Well, I think it's it's iconic. It, it's one of those yeah. series that kind of established that character to people who didn't know the character as yeah. well. And gave people an idea of that character. And a lot of people grew up on that series having that idea of all those characters. Oh, yeah. Including one um, Miss Harley Quinn. Yeah. Who... Uh, I think a lot of people know yeah. that that's where that character was created. It wasn't. It didn't come from the comic book. No. It came from the animated series. One of those rare instances where it's just kind of a joyous thing where the television influences the comics uh, rather than the other way around. That happened back in the 70s, too, when there was the uh, 
Shazam television show had that spinoff uh, called Isis. Uh, and that resulted in an ISIS character being created for the comics because it was so popular. Um, and but then it created a terrorist faction. Now, 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 we're going to stay out of anything so negative unless it's directly involved within the comic itself. So, uh, Batman the Animated Series, 1992 to 1995. Yeah. So, so, it's quite old at this point. Yeah, but... It has aged extraordinarily well, which is hard to do for a cartoon. And I think that if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can watch this animated series on uh, Amazon uh, streaming services. All of them, if I'm not mistaken. And if you have certain devices to go with your Amazon, you can hear it uh, simultaneously with small timing differentials because you would have an Echo. Amazon Echo. Bad joke, but mm. you know, that's what I've got at uh, nearing 11 p.m. this evening. It was a good try. Yeah, it was an effort. attempt. I am more than happy to face plant on a joke. Record it forever. I will be able to look back on this and go, man, that was awful. And you too can relive it anytime you want. Just keep pressing rewind. That's right. But like we said, uh, we were able to talk to an individual that was involved in this particular production, voicing the iconic character of Poison Ivy. We were able to talk to Diane Pershing. And she told us a few stories about... like So... People might not recognize her, that they might recognize her voice. And she's done a few yeah. other things here yeah. and there. Absolutely. Uh, but this is the one that she is, at this point, I would say, most recognized for. And we talked about it a little bit, too, yeah. about how she didn't think this was going to be something that she would just be recognized for. And and how she got the how she got the, the position. So I, I, I love it because, you know... the. The, the voices on that show were all chosen so well, or maybe we were just very fortunate to get the individuals to work on it that did. And her voice is who I think of when I think of Poison Ivy. Every other one after is, you know, good to varying degrees, but hers will always be Poison Ivy. And it's, it's, it's her voice. It's Kevin Conroy's voice. It's Mark Hamill's voice on yeah. all those characters. Like you, this, like I was saying, this is the one that I think established a lot of people's perception of these characters. Well, let's take a listen to what Miss Pershing has to say, and we will be back in a moment. All right, we're here at uh, PopCon 2019 with uh, yet another wonderful voice actress that has uh, inspired so many of us over the year, uh, Miss Diane Pershing. How are you doing today? I am so good. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for taking some time to talk to us. Well, you know, first of all, I love to talk, so that's not a problem. (laughs) And I just think it's very important for people to hear what professionals have to say about some of the stuff that we go through. I I think it's good information for them. I definitely agree. Now, most people would know you from your work as Poison Ivy in the Batman animated series. Yes. So, how did you manage to uh, land such a fantastic role? Oh, it was complete serendipity, my dears. It's one of those things where you have no control over the timing of your life, but this was a wonderful one. I was hired to come to the session that they were recording. It was the first one they were going to introduce Poison Ivy, Pretty Poison. And I was hired to do a couple of incidental lines, you know, a police person or a whatever. And I and the actress that was supposed to do Poison Ivy, I do know her name, but I'm not going to say it, mm-hmm. was found by the producers to not have quite the right sound. So it's last minute they needed to find a Poison Ivy. And it didn't have to be that day, but... They were going to record. Andrea Romano, the brilliant voice director, said to me, would you like to try this? And I said, sure. And she gave me the picture, and I saw what she looked like. I said she was kind of a hormonal tinkerbell. (laughs) You know, that's what she looked like. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at some of the lines, and I thought, okay, she's sexy, and she's a PhD. So I can use my cosmetic voice, which is what I did when I was selling lingerie and cosmetics on TV commercials, okay? And I'm also, somehow when I talk, I sound smart. You know, sometimes I'm very smart, sometimes not so much. But in this particular thing, 
a very sexy woman with a little edge to it so that you can hear there's a brain working. Mm -hmm. And I auditioned and they said, you got it. And that was that story. Is that fabulous? That is fantastic. Yeah, just like a right place, right time. Exactly. And you can't control that. That's called life. Yes. Yeah. Did, did you have any idea that it would get the reaction that it did uh, over time? Absolutely none. In fact, I didn't know that it was iconic, this series, till about three years ago when someone said to me, did you know you have a fan base? And I said, what? <laughs> yeah, check it out. I checked it out online. I went, oh, my God. People know my name mm -hmm. from that thing. People like me. People have voted me the best Poison Ivy voice, you know? I think and that's I said, fair. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. You know, and I went, really? And then a friend said, yeah, you should be doing Comic Cons. I said, really? And I contacted some people, and here I am. So uh, that's, no, I had no idea. No, no. I just like well, in the actual like that particular show m me personally i find myself constantly looking for where i can find it meaning that show's been out for such a long time obviously you can go and purchase it but if you just want to sit down and watch an episode or two or a season of it right i've i've constantly found myself over the last 5 years for the batman and superman a lot of these things trying to find where i could watch them because they are such they leave such an impact on you, and I, I think they shape your character, like the character's impression, yes, right? So if yes. you watch these, like when you see a movie or TV show now, you think you, you compare it to that. Do you find people doing the same thing? Like very much so, very much so. And they're always asking me, "What do you think of?" And then they all the iterations that came after. I don't actually pay any attention to those, so I don't know. I have no opinions. I just do know that the fans come up to me. And some of them with their tears in their eyes, and they say, "You were my childhood. You know, you were the safe place I could go to after school." Some of them have been abused. Some women, young women, have been abused, and they said that Poison Ivy, in telling Harley Quinn not to let men do that to her, had made a huge impression on them. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know I had affected so many people. I had no idea, and it isn't me. It's my voice work in a wonderful cartoon. I don't yeah. take credit for it. I didn't write the stuff, you know. But it's kind of overwhelming. It really is. And wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, it all, it all gels together. And it, it affects people, but it's also affected the storylines in the comic books did, over the yeah. years. I mean, yeah, even, that's what they say. I don't know. I haven't read the comic books. Even yeah. now, there is a whole series of Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn off doing their thing. And their, their relationship is a, a really fun and complicated friendship. That uh, that uh, it that's what that's thing. what they say. I remember that Arlene and I did um, a thing called Gotham Girls, which was on the internet only, mm -hmm. and we had the best time recording that. That was so much fun. She's a darling, wonderful woman. I love her. Now, I was talking to uh, my co-host a little bit about this uh, ahead of time. Uh, obviously, mm. we both are fans of the original animated Batman show, but I also have a, a slightly different thing that I geek out a little bit that you were involved with. It is a, a, a video game that I played for many hundreds of hours. You did voice work for the Baldur's Gate yes. series. Yes, I did. And uh, So that's... Is, is getting involved with something like that very similar to getting involved with a show, or is it a, is it a different environment completely? Well, actually, because they're games, and whichever path you choose to go down can affect all the other parts of the game, what you're basically asked to do when you do a game is you come into the room, you're given a series of lines, you're asked to read the series of lines five, six different ways, then you're asked to read reactions such as death, uh, you know, a slow death, a fast death, a violent death, uh, whatever, okay? You just need to do a lot. It's vocally taxing. It's quite wonderful. Hmm. Uh, and I love it. So you're talking about having to read the line in so many different ways. Did, yes. Did they give you a chance to react off of the other voice actors that no, were no, present? No, 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 no. Uh, games are always done solo in a recording booth with earphones you know, a, a microphone, and on the other side is somebody telling you, okay, do that faster, do that in three seconds, make it more grotesque, make it more sad, 
I remember once I had to do a dragon, uh, a matriarch dragon, and I had to do like 20 different ways of her being in the death throes. Uh, I mean, it was, but it was fun yeah. because it challenges you. Yeah. You know, it isn't the kind of thing where, where um, you're just given a line and then you do several readings. You have to really come up with a scenario in your head because I'm an actor. I'm a trained stage actor. A scenario in your head in which this is happening, and then let the vocal thing come out, and pray God that it's the one they want, and it usually is, which yeah. is nice. You know, yeah, I love doing games. Well, I had a question that kind of went back before that, because you had mentioned that you were, you came up as a classically trained stage actress. Yes, yes. So, so tell us a little bit about that, like the, the beginnings of your, your acting and, and stage oh, career. Oh, well, I've just always wanted, I looked in the mirror when I was four years old, and this is from my mother, and I said, I'm going to be an actress when I grow up. And she said, yes, dear. And then I started doing plays in, in high school, and then I majored in theater arts at UCLA, and I graduated, and I did lots of theater there and stuff. And my mother said, please get a teaching credential. And I said, no. <laughs> and she said, but then you'll need something to fall back on. And I said, I don't want anything to fall back on. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and from then on, I started out as a singer, a backup singer. That was my first professional job with Johnny Mathis, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. And I did a lot of singing and then stage, singing and stage and singing and stage. And then after I had my children... I settled down in Los Angeles. Somebody mentioned I should do, be doing voiceovers. I had no idea what they were talking about. I found out. I started doing voiceovers, and that's pretty much been my, my main source of income with some time off in between doing a play here and there. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of actually a really fun way to, to make a living. You go to a spot, and you just talk and you create a character in, in a sense kidding? for a I'm in heaven it's I mean really it is I love the life I've lived I'm one of the lucky ones because not everybody can say that you know okay we got something noise all right there's somebody very important has just shown up uh, looks like we're, maybe Jason David is okay. we're waiting for a power ranger power I think. ranger yeah is, Okay, yeah. there they go. All lined up. Well, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody was telling me that there was going to be a very large line for that, and that my reaction was, but for, for the Power Rangers? Does, it, <laughs> does that still have a following? There we go. That's fantastic. Well, but that's exactly how I felt. I have a following 27 years after I recorded that. You know, I didn't even know it was still on the air. And it's that that goes back to what I was saying before is that a lot of times that that stuff's not on the air. Like, no, I know. So I know. where where so if you are a younger person today and you want to watch this show, how do you watch the show? Oh, and all these people, like everybody knows the the, the show. Like I even though it's twenty seven years ago and it's not on air, I, everybody I, knows I, these. The shows. only thing I know is that it was on Amazon. <laughs> And you had to pay to be on Amazon. You had to actually have that as a streaming uh, thing. And and then it was on, and it was on, and it was on. And then they took it off because they were doing the Blu-ray edition. Mm. So I don't think there's any legal way you can watch it now. I'm not sure. But but I'm sure there are other ways. Yeah, I'm you know. sure yeah, there are yeah, yeah, some sneaky yeah. ways. It was on it was on Amazon. That's yeah. why I was oh, yeah. plugging through some of the seasons of that's it. That's why I saw That's when I saw it. I said... Oh, I have a fan base. I should look at the show again. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Geeky question. Yes. Um, so you have uh, this iconic character here. It, have you ever thought about voicing a Marvel character? And have I ever thought about it? It's a matter of me asking, being asked. Um. It's, not a, it's not that I go, hi, I'd like to do this today. I have. Uh, we had a, a, the old Marvel. I did some, um, I did some stuff for... Um, we, we were we were interrupted by a darling fan yes, who came up and wanted to buy a picture and was at the uh, Q and A that we had yesterday afternoon, John Glover and myself and we had such a good time. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. John Glover is just fantastic. Oh please! please. <laughs> I mean, I just met him when he started doing cons about nine months ago, and we are basically amazing good friends now he is I worshipped him I said to him when I met him I said oh my god you're one of my favorite actors he's yeah. a lovely man yeah I, I, I gotta say I this this is uh, this is such a fantastic thing not just to see the people that you love but to get a chance to see how how 
the relationships form exactly, over time. Exactly, exactly. And doing cons, mm-hmm. I've met all kinds of people that I might not have met before, including the fans. Interesting, wonderful people, the cosplayers, fascinating stuff. And you can you can see as you as these folks walk by the level of detail that some people just That's right. Just spend in and it's not just it's Star Wars, it's anime, it's comics, it's everything. It's, it's all kinds of things, yeah. Yeah. Well let's ask one future forward question. Do yes. You, do you have any projects right now that you're working on that you're really excited about that you can talk about? Actually, no. I am a classic aging actress. I'm sort of, no, I really am. I'm sort of heading down the river um, away from, I mean, I've been doing this over 40 years. I've had a very, very, thank you, successful career. I've supported two children with it. I've sent them to college. I have a nice life. I have fine pensions from my unions. And I work less and less as time goes on, which is just how it is, okay? So now I'm thrilled to be doing these cons. This is wonderful. And in between, I have a very active and vibrant life. I also do film reviews for a small newspaper. I'm a writer also, by the way. I don't know if you know this. I did not. But I published, um, not self-published, I published 19 romance novels in the early part of this century. I I loved writing them, and then I stopped writing them because I didn't care anymore. So I've been a singer and a writer and an actor. That's kind of amazing. And it's been a wonderful life. I mean, I've gotten joy out of all of these things. Are are your uh, things that you publish under your name, or do you have like a ghost name? They're under my name. name. No, I didn't didn't use a pseudonym. I did not. No, so you can find them... um, there, there are some e-books available. There are some audio books available, and they're used. The, they were paperbacks. They're re, they're used online if anybody wants to. Um, I read them recently, and I thought, mm, not so sure how how well they hold up. Only because they're. I wrote them in the actually in the nineties, and everything has changed, changed so much. I mean, we had answering machines then. You know, it's just different. No cell phones. You know. Oh yeah. gosh, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk with us, and it has been just a delight because I've, I've wanted to, to meet you for some time, Aww, and, uh, thank and you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's, it's great that we have the chance to do it and that you give us the opportunity to do well, it, Well, thank you for asking me. All right. Now, wasn't that fantastic? I know I, again, had to uh, conceal my squeals of joy. Uh, just a little bit and having a chance to talk to her super nice yeah she was she was really cool and uh uh in in a lot of ways much like uh uh mr glover that we had a chance to talk to every every time that i see both him and her i just kind of want to give them a big old hug and invite them home for dinner <laughs> dinner that kind that kind of reaction now not everything that we did was just related to comic books that Mm. day or comic book movies or television shows even though that may be kind of where our focus is there were a lot of really cool people at this convention yes uh we were just discussing a little bit too that this convention if you look at the title is pop con Um, although a lot of the stuff i feel like that you see there is is comic book related they had a whole section where people were kind of all star wars up Mm -hmm. right and there was some sections of uh things maybe not comic book related but not a lot a lot of it was comic book related but the people that they had there for you to talk to get interviews with or do autographs uh there were a lot that were not and actually the ones that were the most popular from what we could see in our time there were the ones that necessarily weren't comic people no definitely not i mean for those that are familiar with rick and morty i mean who's not familiar with rick and morty at this point i mean um justin roiland he had quite a line I consistent mean, too consistent yeah and that makes sense that show is is pretty brilliant even if i haven't seen a whole a whole lot of it what i have seen is pretty pretty smart and funny and just silly but the other one that was the surprise the surprise one, yes at least to me surprising was the the uh the power ranger line i just yeah i, I cannot uh put that into words uh how surprising that was so when when we were there kind of just 
strolling around, there were people standing there waiting for this person to get there. Oh yeah. What Jason David Frank. Jason David Frank. Okay. Yeah, he was he was the green Power Ranger on the original Power Rangers show, but he was actually in more than one Power Rangers show. So he was that popular. They brought him back. Kept bringing him back. Yeah, and he was he always had a always had a line. Like I said, he didn't he wasn't there the whole day. No. But when he was there, there were people waiting and then as he was there signing you know, signing talking, uh, the line was steady. The biggest yeah. the biggest line of the day was him. He had five to ten times the people anybody else did. Oh yeah. Um there were some people from other T V shows, like we mentioned there was supposed to be two agents of Shield folks there there was one there's one um not a lot of attention no unfortunate i love that show it I, it's so good um then there was uh asher angel was yeah. there is if we you know if you'd like to re- listen to our review of uh shazam uh that's where he was from and he had some a couple people yeah but i mean donald glover was there too donald- and he was he was he had some people it was his was intermittent it was really strange because he'd have like a group and then nothing and then a group and then nothing um everybody should go see uh mr glover at any given point because he's just so fantastic and so nice and and we talked we talked about how he was in the shazam movie and you might have missed him yeah because he was right at the beginning and that was about it rather scary semi-middle part in the middle part yep but um, so there's that. We had a, a couple of um, uh, YouTube personalities here and there that were present. Um, some some individuals that you might not have expected, like uh, uh, Ilan Mitchell Smith from um, uh, Weird Science, is what most people would know him from. Mm-hmm. Uh, spoke to him briefly. He was quite nice. Uh, weren't quite able to work out a time to to get him on on uh on the show but nope. uh phil lamar was there for people that love mad tv and he did the voice of uh green lantern uh john stewart john green. stewart green lantern on oh, his and he and talking about another iconic voice for a character oh gosh yeah i mean we really wanted to talk to him and we're not giving up on that one we're still trying to find a way to work to get him on the show yeah and i think a lot of people so our age would recognize him from mad tv yeah um most ages might recognize him when he was in Pulp Fiction. Oh yeah, uh, the the one scene where they pop into the uh, apartment complex, <laughs> and that's not what they remember him from. <laughs> they remember him from, from the back seat of the car. Yes. So, uh, but it's that's the character he plays in, in that movie. So he he was there, and same thing. He had just a smattering of people every now and then. Yeah, I. I Every time I go to one of these conventions now, when I see just nobody at some of these booths, it makes me want to pull my hair out. I mean, I understand there's going to be some people that are going to be more popular than others, but all these people have just made some really great stuff. Now, side side note that might be related to this, what do you think the age group of most of the folks there was? It looked like 30s to 50s. It was a lot of families. Yeah. There, there was, I, thought, I thought there was a lot of uh, high school kids as well yeah there was definitely a contingent of high schoolers so maybe that maybe that was a contributing factor too maybe they just didn't recognize half yeah. these people or what they did what their work was and that's why rick and morty was so popular that that guy so who knows speculation yeah that's all but it is we did get a chance to have a conversation with one gentleman now i i was pretty excited about <laughs> this gentleman that we got to talk to so um one of uh, at this point, you have a couple comedies that are, I feel like, for our age group, um, you know, when we were going through college and stuff like that, or just getting out of college, you, there's always age ranges and movies and stuff like that. So one of the iconic movies, I think, is just a classic comedy movie, in my opinion, is Super Troopers, mm-hmm. right? So there were a couple folks there that were, you know, part of, there's a, the Broken Lizard 
group. There's five of them in that group. Two of those folks were there at this convention and nobody was talking to them. And I just feel like nobody knew who they were. Like Almost, almost nobody. Yeah. We, we wanted to talk to both, but one was consistently busy with like one person. That, that's <laughs> true. Time. That was Eric Stolhansky. Yeah. So he was, he always had like a person chatting with him. And I, I personally felt like and the other person we, we, we spoke to, we actually had a chance to speak to was Paul Soder. Yeah. Those like, maybe it's just me, but I felt like those guys should have had so much more attention yeah, a lot paid of to them. Um, now it goes back to the, maybe the age group thing. So super troopers came out in 2001. Whew. It's kind of hard to think that that movie is uh, almost 20 years old, almost 20 years old. So once again, maybe those folks, there are just like, what's, Super Troopers, <laughs> but they've exactly done so many other things too. Yeah, you know, beer league. They, uh, they've been pretty busy. I mean, they were steady at least putting out material since then. Yep, and beer fest, I should say, and they they were really nice. And we got a chance to, like I said, have a conversation. We chatted a little bit about how Super Troopers came to be, um, and what they're working on right now. So enjoy a little chitty chat with Mr. Paul Soder. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, we got Mr. Paul Soder here uh, at the Indie Pop Con. Uh, some of you folks may know him uh, from the Broken Lizard. Uh, yes. So, first of all, once again, thank you for kind of joining us here, being able to chat with us. Uh, so, tell us a little bit about um, how everything kind of got started with your group of. Of, of friends to get together to, to make these movies to, to kind of create the creative process. Yeah, we all went to college together in upstate New York, uh, Colgate University, and uh, Jay Chandrasekhar, who's the director of the group, assembled uh, a sketch comedy group uh, just to perform on campus. We didn't, Colgate didn't have anything like that. There was no improv group. There was no sketch comedy. And so he put together a group uh, most of us knew each other, either those guys were in the same fraternity, I knew some guys from doing stand-up. Um, so we were part of the team that Jay put together in college, and then after we graduated, Jay called us up and said, hey, why don't we keep doing this in New York? And at that time, you know, you know sketch comedy groups could get on TV, MTV. Comedy Central was new then, and uh, so we started doing stage shows in New York City. And after doing that for a few years, we would always do little bits of filmmaking, little short videos that went kind of in between the live sketches. And we got more and more into doing that, and this was the mid-90s, so independent film was taking off, and so we at some point said, hey, instead of trying to get on TV as a sketch comedy group, why don't we do long-form comedy movies, more like Monty Python. And um, so we sort of transitioned <coughs> into doing that and uh, made a movie at Colgate University that did some festivals, a movie called Puddle Cruiser. And uh, from there, we just really liked working that way and got the money from an investor to do Super Troopers and sort of each, each film kind of did well enough to get another film going and that's what we've been doing for yeah, the last 20 years. Yeah, so that, that's what I was kind of reading before is that it was just that, that first film that you guys did got you enough recognition to kind of get someone to believe in you and is, is that person still part of the, like, throws the money and does investing? The guy who invested in Super Troopers um, is Pete Lengel, and uh, we knew him. He was the father of a, a woman we went to, to college with. He has since he invested in the sequel, mm -hmm. um, so we still do stuff with him. You know, after Super Troopers, we did studio a couple studio movies, so we, we weren't looking for Luckily, we weren't looking for private financing, but then when we had to crowdfund Super Dude. Troopers 2... Uh, he stepped up and gave us a big chunk. So, yeah, he's become our kind of go-to guy whenever we're in trouble. Now, let me ask about that on uh, Super Troopers 2. Was it, was there no studio that was going to, like, just be willing to do it, or was well, it just we, kind of Well, we a could only go to Fox Searchlight. So that's, that's, Fox Searchlight is the company that bought Super Troopers at Sundance, and 
so they own the rights. So at the time, we wanted to make the movie. They, they knew that the first Super Troopers had done really well post-theatrical. I mean, it took a while to find that audience. So from their point of view, yes, they admitted that it had performed really well on DVD and on home video. Um, but for them to make a commitment to having the second Super Troopers be a theatrical release was for them, they felt like a risk. A risk. Um, because they just, even if they knew we had fans and they acknowledged that we had fans, they had no way of guaranteeing that those were fans that were going to go to the theater to see it. So basically what they said was, was, hey, look, if you can get the money, then we will test it if it tests... Uh, if it gets a certain test score and preview screenings, then we will guarantee a theatrical release. So that put us in a position where we had to go out and find the money. But then what was nice is that's what led us to crowdfunding. Yeah. And, you know, that gave us basically half of the budget of the movie. But what it also did was really demonstrated to the studio that there was a very passionate fan base. So that helped a lot. And then we shot the movie. It tested really well, so they said, okay, well, this is great. Now, we have the confidence to put it in theaters, and it opened really well. And so what's nice about that is we've already started talking about Super Troopers 3 with them because they, they no longer need to be convinced that there is an audience that will go to the theater. Uh, you know, it, it opened on April 20th of last year, and it was the number one movie in the country that day that it opened. Yeah. So for them, they're like, okay, yeah, well, if you guys want to do a third one, we don't have to go through all that jumping through all those hoops uh, to get that made. So that puts us in a position where now we're writing the script, and I think hopefully next year when the script is ready, we'll be able to shoot. It won't be 15 years between movies. It'll wow. be more like three years, which is <laughs> a lot better. Yeah, that's that's great. That's that's the, that's the a boost of confidence that even makes, I feel like, writing it even that much easier, you know, more fun, because you have a little bit more leeway on what you can do. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that was always the nice thing, too, about with us bringing in that financing, the studio then really only gave us a few notes. And it allowed us to write the second one the way that we wrote the first one, which is just for what pleased ourselves. You know, that, that script could be put together based on making each other laugh and not going through all the studio notes of it. So uh, hopefully the third one will be the same where they kind of just let us do our things. We know our audience at this point, you know, we don't, yeah. we, we don't uh, uh, need to work very hard to think about what, what makes our audience laugh. So on, on all these films, it looks like everybody's kind of getting the equal writing credits. Is, is everybody kind of all, the whole group, is everybody a writing contributor to it? Or Yeah, there are five of us, and for us it's always been, you know, the, the only way to really capture the magic that we have is to have the five of us in a room together. Um, it just works best that way. I mean, sometimes out of necessity, we'll, we'll split up some chunks. Guys will go off and write individually and bring it back. But as much as possible, we want everybody in a room together. Uh, you know, that's just, you know, like I said, that's, that's how we know stuff works is if it makes everybody else laugh. And is that the same thing from like a production standpoint as well? Like you guys all have your hands kind of together uh, or separately depending on, on that? what level? Like in pre-production, I think everybody stays really involved. When we're shooting, ultimately, you know, you can only have one director. It confuses people to have five guys uh, giving yeah. out orders or having opinions. So we sort of, you know, we make sure Jay understands our own five points of view in pre-production so that when we're shooting he can be the guy and then usually in post-production Kevin and, and Jay are the two guys who, who are in the room editing I'll pop in Eric will pop in Steve will pop in but that's another case where it's like just five guys in an editing room that's a recipe for being a long long miserable process <laughs> yeah. so yeah and I don't have the taste for, for editing as much so I'm happy to let those guys <laughs> Drive, stick yeah, to the yeah, strengths, we're, and we're, yeah. at that, we're at that stage. So, is there anything that you've got going on, going on right now? I know we already talked about you're kind of in the stages, possibly of writing yeah. for three. But is there anything else that you have going well, on right now? Um, so, Kevin and Steve set up a show last year at True TV called Tacoma FD, mm -hmm. uh, a firefighter comedy, 
and uh, I'm a writer and producer on that. So that's a great if you you know anybody who likes the broken lizard style of humor. That's a great funny show. Yes, very much. Uh, so. We just finished season one, and they have. Um, I think it looks like we're doing season two. It's not confirmed, but we're told it's a good chance. So we'll hopefully have a season two of Tacoma FD uh, next year. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to get these scripts written uh, with the guys, and so that there's another movie to shoot next year. Yeah. It is do you like do you like the TV compared to the, the, the film? I hadn't done it before last year, and it was a lot of fun. There's something really nice about you know sitting down and writing 10 episodes um over three months it's much more the the pace is much you know you don't have you know for us it takes us a year or two to write a 190 page script whereas in a writer's room you're knocking out 10 half hours in three months so it's good it's <coughs> it makes you a lot less precious about things you can just jam it all out and get it out there nice very good well I mean, I think that's unless you've got something. Have, you have, have one have, question. I have one question. So I always like to ask, especially when somebody has a history in uh, stand-up comedy, uh, where where does your inspiration come from from a comedic standpoint? Are there specific uh, artists or specific uh, pieces of work that really influenced what you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, we when we all met in college, I think one of the things that drew us all together were that we all loved so much of the same stuff. So the Monty Python movies... The John Landis movies, uh, we were all uh, big Saturday Night Live guys. And then for me, um, you know, as a, as a kid watching syndicated TV, like when I was a kid, you didn't have cable, so you, you had like one channel that ran syndicated reruns. So I would go home and watch MASH and Bob Newhart and The Odd Couple, and those are what really, nice. uh, um, I think, uh, formed my comedic sensibilities for sure. Some pretty good shows in there. Yeah, 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 the classics. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, once again, I appreciate your time taking just a little bit of a moment out of your busy day here to give us a chance just to ask a few questions about your yourself and your industry and that type of stuff. Yeah, so, my pleasure. All right. Thank you. Sure thing. So enjoy a little chitty chat with Mr. Paul Soder. <laughs> oh. Richard's playing with his phone. Sotomayor. <laughs> right. Now, that was pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh I uh, I may not be what you would consider to be like the biggest type of fan for that kind of a movie. I like comedies and stuff, but I maybe didn't geek out quite so much on that. But I kind of get where, I mean, just talking to him for a little while, you could feel where, where he had his comedy instincts and, and, and just kind of a relatability that obviously came through between him and the other gentleman that made these films to the to the person watching it just you you felt you could feel it yep yeah so hopefully you guys found that as entertaining as we did and maybe learned something new and uh at the very least were uh, entertained yes now we have more discussions with a, a gentleman but that one's much longer
Yes, it is. So what we've kind of decided to do is do our discussion right now for this episode with these three little snippets of discussions that we had. Mm -hmm. Um, So technically, this is part Part one. one. Uh, We will have a part two, which will include a fairly lengthy and honestly amazing discussion that we had with... Stuart Sager. Stuart Sager. So that was that was good. He was he was a good talker, and we're good listeners. So that's the easiest part about being a you know having a good interview, right? Yeah. So and it, you, that may not be a name that everybody's completely familiar with, which is just a crime in and of itself. Fantastic artist. If you get a chance to see some of his work in, in comics, you should definitely do so. He's got a heck of a style. But we'll talk about that more in our second installment on. Indie PopCon. Now, that may be a couple of weeks out because we have so much to bring you. This next week, uh, we're actually going to be bringing you some other interviews and some other information from another convention that happened just one week after PopCon. Mm -hmm. And that's Origins in Ohio. Now, my compatriot here uh, was not able to... uh, make the trip with me so i went about it solo but uh yeah a lot of these trips are going to be a little bit more difficult for me to go to it it can sometimes happen that way but uh, i think i brought back some gems for those that are really into uh tabletop games and uh, that sort of thing i've got some great interviews with some manufacturers of said games and we also have an interview with amber benson who played tara on buffy the vampire slayer very excited about that wow so keep tuned to our channel which is on youtube which channel was that the youtube channel (laughs) the youtube channel pudding pudding guys yes (laughs) now now is it side note is it just me but when you say um gems did anybody else who's listening to this uh, start to sing the uh gem theme song I'm not certain how many people actually know the Gem theme song anymore. Yes, when you were our age and growing up and watching Saturday morning cartoons, and you were a boy, there's a good chance that when that came on that you you might have turned it away to some other cartoon. I enjoyed it. I, I loved Gem. It, it's, it's possible, but for sure you heard the song before. I mean, they were musicians, and how could you not want to watch it? They they would play their instruments, and they had they were on a star, and the star would fly. Not really something that happened in the show, but that was enough to catch my attention. I had to watch it. It was, uh, it was a fun show. Yeah, I know some of you are singing this song right now. I'm not going to sing it. No, I'm definitely gonna, not going to It's going to be stuck it. in your head for a little bit while. So. Well, hopefully it will... No longer be stuck in your head when you join us next week for part one of our coverage of Origins. Thank you for being with us today. Jim is my name. No one else is the same. <laughs> <laughs>